Anyway, if you have your Bibles, I want you to do me a favor, and I want you to open your Bibles real quickly to two passages of Scripture. I'm going to talk about several Scriptures, but I only really want you to go to two this morning. I want you to go to 1 Peter chapter 2, and I want you to go over to Luke chapter 15. So you get to stay in the New Testament today. But I want you to go to, I want you to, go to 1 Peter chapter 2, and I also want you to go to Luke chapter 15. We've been teaching on the series, Tough Stuff. And as I was preparing for today's message, you know, the Lord just began to deal with me. Over the last several weeks, the Lord's just been dealing with me about just issues that I'm walking through. And I shared with the first service, most of the time when I'm writing a sermon, I don't write it for you. I write it for me. I, I write that message out of things that, and areas of my life that God is working, through, working with me on. And as he works with me in these areas, hopefully when I preach the message, there'll be a benefactor, and that's you and me as we share the gospel together. But we find in 1 Peter uh, a reiteration as you read the Old Testament, whether you read the book of Exodus, you read the book of Deuteronomy, or you read some of the Psalms, you'll find this passage encapsulated in some of the Old Testament. And Peter begins to preach. And as he's writing and he, as he shares this message, he makes this statement. He says, for you are a chosen people. Say, I'm a chosen. You are a chosen people. Uh, the Bible says in the King James, a royal priesthood. The, King, the New Living says this. It says, you are royal priests. It says, you are a holy nation. God's very own possession. Say, that's me. Do you see that about yourself? Do you see yourself as an individual who's chosen by God, royalty, a, there's, a, there's a holiness about you, and that you're God's very own possession? He goes on to say, as a result, you can show others the goodness of God. Because of what God has said about you, because of what God has indicated about you, whether you're a young person still in school or you're a senior saint running the final, the final decades of your, of your race, the Bible says that you are God's. And as a result, God show, you have the ability to show others the goodness of God. For he called you out. Of darkness into his wonderful light. Aren't you glad? How many of you remember the darkness? Some of you remember the darkness. Some of you remember those days. Some of you remember what, what happened in those days. But you know what? The darkness doesn't define you. He brought you into light. Now that's a good word right there. We can preach that, but that's for another day. You're no longer in darkness. You're in light. Then he goes on to say, once you had no identity. Hmm. I love the way that the New Living Translation says that. Once you had no identity. You know what's funny? Is even when we find our identity, we keep looking for it. For whatever reason, for whatever reason, we struggle with our identity. And that's what we're going to talk about today. As I read this passage, it says, once you had no identity as a people, now you are God's people. Once you received no mercy, and now you have received God's mercy. Father, I just ask in the few short minutes that we have together, I pray that your word would come alive in our hearts. I pray, Heavenly Father, that we don't preach, Heavenly Father, anything outside of the leadership of Holy Spirit. And Father, I ask right now, Lord, that you begin to challenge the hearts and the minds and the listeners, that what is said, Heavenly Father, are but simply the oracles of heaven. Help me, Heavenly Father, to discern, Heavenly Father, whether it's me or you. Help me only to say what you say. In Jesus' name, amen. Once you had no identity. You know, how many of you have ever asked this question of yourself, who am I? Have you ever asked yourself this question, why am I here? Have you ever asked this question, what's my purpose? And what you begin to do is you begin to, you begin to question the very identity of who you are. You, you don't know, and, and, and whether or not we're talking about young people or older folks, when we watch television, we, we peruse social media for any length of time. We listen to podcasts, or, or you'll quickly, you can quickly get discouraged, even disillusioned, maybe even depressed, because people everywhere, young and old, educated or not, all have something in common. They're struggling with who they are. 
They struggle with who they are. And whether they struggle with who they are, it's their identity. They question who they are. You know, young people, I think about students. We get confused, and, 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 and it's a barrage of things coming across social media. But there's, a, there's this confusion that comes as a result of our gender. And what is our self-image and our purpose? Fathers, we get frustrated because we don't see whether or not our life is inspiring to our kids or those that we come in contact. Moms, let me just say this. Don't allow your identity to be that of a taxi driver, a chef, or, or simply the runner of a laundromat and a cleaning company. That's not your identity, moms. But sometimes that's how you feel. And is that all I'm here for? To be a taxi? Is that all I'm here for? Is to, to, to run errands and grocery shops? Your identity is not in what you do. Grandparents, you might ask yourself the question, have I, have I left a legacy that's worth talking about? And you, and you begin to question whether or not that what raising of your kids and the raising of your grandkids, did your life make a difference? Business owners, you wonder whether or not what you have done, you, whether you've encountered something or created something that the next generation will even be blessed by. So much of who you are is wrapped up in your identity and how you see yourself. We struggle in how we see ourselves. And when we see ourselves, you know, identity is simple. You know, when, 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 you're, when, you're, when, when, when you go to uh, uh, cash a check at the bank, at the credit union. They ask you to prove your identity, don't they? They ask you for what? Your driver's license or an ID. It'd be kind of interesting if they did that when voting, but we'll just leave that one alone. <laughs> I threw that in there. That was purely carnal. I am so sorry. <laughs> How many begin? I get an amen. No, um, but they ask for your identification. Why? They want to make sure that the person writing the check. Or, or, or cashing the check, is rightful owner to the monies that that check is cashed for, right? When we talk about our identity, it can be defined as a person's name, the facts about who we are. You know, you might say, well, Pastor Bob's identity is he's the pastor of Lighthouse Church. He's the husband of Dana Keek. He's the parents of Lauren and Emma. That, that may be the way you identify me. We can identify ourselves by, by who we are, facts about us, showing or proving who someone is, the qualities of a person or a group that make them different from others. We identify, sometimes we identify as, as a church. We identify as, as members of Lighthouse. We, we might identify as, as a member of certain denomination. We might identify as some ethnic group. We might identify ourselves by so many different ways. We identify by our education. We identify, identify by, by our height. We identify by our athletic prowess. We identify ourselves by our financial bank accounts. We identify by, our, by, by whether we're employed or unemployed. There are so many things that we choose to identify ourselves by. The sad fact of the matter is, those identifications aren't who you are. When you come into this walk with God, you know, we can have our identity. Let, let, me, let me pause for just a minute. Did you know that, how, how many of you have ever had your identity stolen? Has anybody ever had their identity stolen? First service, we had several people raise their hands. But, but when you have your identity stolen, it messes with everything. How many of you have ever been mistaken, Arvin? Arvin Graham has a twin brother named Darvin. And I bet you his whole life he's had an identity where, where, where they've come up and say, hey, Darvin. He goes, that's, that's not me. That's my brother. Mistaken identity. Anybody ever have a mistaken identity? Well, you must not be talking about me. That must be, one, must be my brother. We can lose our identity. Whether we're a mom and all we identify as a parent, as a, as a, as, as a taxi driver. We can lose our identity in so many different ways. How, how many of you know that, that we can be confused in our identity? Society today is confused about their identity. We can not only be confused, but we can have a, an identity imprinted upon us. Let me, let me give you an example of what I mean. You know what? I had a little brother. I've shared this story before, but, but I had a little brother. And, and my little brother, when he was in kindergarten, had a teacher that imprinted upon him that he would never be smart. 
You had a parent in your life that said you'd never be worth anything. You had an individual in your life that said you could never accomplish anything. How many of you know that's a negative imprint on your identity? Now, there are those of you that are in this room that had a positive, uh, somebody positively imprinted upon your life. My granddad, my, gra my grandpa Castle, he was best man in my wedding. Man, I wanted to be like my granddad. But we can, have, we can have imprinted on us. We can have a personal identification. We can have a national identification. You know, God bless America. I mean, you know, we, start, we all stand up. I pledge of allegiance. And all of a sudden, there's a national identity that takes place. All of us ascribe to certain identities. But did you know that when our identification is identified in the wrong place with the wrong thing, that we can, we can also have an identity that's in crisis? Have you ever had an identity crisis? 50-year-old man goes and buys a Corvette and trades in the wife. You laugh, but it happens all the time. It happens all the time. You can have identity crises. Crises is? is that a word? Crises. crises. Thank you, my English. Te my, thank you. I appreciate that. But, but you can have an identity crisis. See, one of the things that I understand is that the enemy will do everything he can to create an identity crisis in your life. Because he doesn't want you to see who you are. He doesn't want you to see what Christ has done in you. He doesn't want you to see what Christ has done for you. And as a result, what we try to do is we long for the spouse so that we can be married and have that identity. We long for the career so that we can have that financial identity. There are things that we do because we're striving for things outside of the identity that Christ wants you to have. And see, when I, when I have these wrong identities, one of the things that I've learned is even as a believer, the devil will do whatever it takes to keep you from finding your identity. He doesn't want you to find out that you are chosen. He doesn't want you to find out that you're holy. He doesn't want you to find out that you're righteous. He doesn't want you to find out you're forgiven. He doesn't want you to find out that, 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 that you can do all things. He doesn't want you to find out those things because I've learned something. And I, and I was reading, I was watching actually a video. I was watching a video by a, a, by a person. His name is Rick Warren. Anybody ever hear of Pastor Rick Warren? I caught about a three-minute clip of a video that, he, that, that I was watching. And, 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 and I, I usually, just so you know, just kind of studying Habits 101. As I'm studying, I'm listening to things. Even though, even though I'm not listening to it, it's on. How many of you know I saturate my mind with the words? So, so it's a speaker, it's a minister, it might be worship music, whatever. And all of a sudden, how many of you have ever been listening to something and you're not really listening and it catches your attention? He said something that caused a thought to grow in me. Did you know that? Did you know that the devil cannot beat God? How many of you know that? How many of you would agree with me that God is, God is bigger than the devil? Amen? Yay, God, boo, devil. Can you say that with me? Yay, God, boo, devil. All right, so, so we know that God is all powerful. The creator of the universe, can he be beaten by the devil? No, good, church 101. You guys got that answer great. So if we know that the devil cannot beat God, he's going to use alternative methods. If he can't beat God, let me say it this way. Did you know that God loves you? You know what? Maybe today you just need to hear that. Somebody's in the room and you just need to hear God loves you. You've had a bad week. You've made some mistakes. Let me just tell you this. God loves you. Don't get confused. Don't get frustrated. Don't get worried. God loves you. But guess what? Because God loves you, the devil knows that. So guess what the devil will do? He can't beat God. God's here. Devil's here, right? He can't beat. He cannot beat God. They tr he tried that once. Do you remember that? It happened, it happened about 2,000 years ago with his son Jesus, right? The devil kind of, he kind of thought he had him. But how many of you know that didn't work out so well for him? Okay, so... If he can't beat God, but can he beat that which he loves? Hmm. Now stop and think about that for just a minute. If, 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 if the devil can hurt you, he in turn hurts God because he loves you. So he'll do everything he can to hurt you and put you into this place because I understand that he cannot hurt God. 
But he does do his best to hurt his kids. And sometimes we let him. We let him do that. We let him do it to us. We give him permission. We give him actually sometimes even invitation. Robbie Dawkins in his book, Identity Theft, made this statement. He says, you are not the person Satan says you are. You do not have to listen to the condemning voice in your head or those negative feelings in your emotions. Do not trust them. They are his lies. He would like nothing better than to get you to doubt yourself and the God who created you. How many of you have ever been there? I think we've all been there from time to time. We've all, we've all had that identity crisis. And we begin to believe what the devil says more than what God says. And, and it's interesting. Uh, I think his, his name is Timothy Keller. He made this statement. And I, I gave them this for you to put up on the screen. And it says this. The Bible says that our real problem is that every one of us is building our identity on something besides Jesus. We all do it. We all do it. We, we try to identify ourselves by stuff. But the problem is, is the devil will do whatever he can to hang. And, and he, he, try, he likes to hang identities on us almost like a signage. And, and, and some of you in the room still are struggling with wearing this sign. And maybe your sign says sinner. You know what? How many of you know we've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God? But sin doesn't have to identify me. Right? How about this? Disappointment. You're nothing but a disappointment. You'll never amount to anything. Guess what? We wear that as a sign sometimes. Rather than allowing just simply it being an experience of disappointment. How many of you know I've disappointed my wife? I've disappointed my kids. I've disappointed Pastor Barry and Candy. I might have even disappointed you. But I don't wear disappointment as, as, as an identity of who I am. How many of you know we've all failed and fallen short of the glory of God? The Bible tells us that. But is failure your identity? I'm never going to amount to anything. I can't accomplish nothing. I, I, I fail at everything I put my hand to. You know what? When you start claiming that identity as your own, you, you, you circumvent the identity that Christ has given you and you replace it with a wrong identity. And you know what? Can I just say it, guys, and just be as gentle as I can? We've allowed it in the church. Can, can I just be honest with you? There was a, there was a season in my life when, when I was pastoring in Union City, Tennessee. And, and I was preaching. I, it was my first pastorate, senior pastorate. And I was preaching. And, and, and I, I'm, I'm a teacher, treacher type of personality. I, I'm not a, you know, blow your hair back type of thing, you know, sweat through my suits, hanky waving type of preacher. Some of y'all like that better. I understand that. I, I, it's just not my personality, okay? What you see is what you get. <laughs> it is what it is. You know, but I had, how many of you know that in the church, unintentionally, people will try to place an identity on you? They tried to do it to my kids. You're a pastor's kid. You're a pastor's daughter. You ought not do that. You ought to, you're a pastor. How many of you know that's, a, that's, a, that's, a, that's an identity that was trying to be imposed upon my daughter? But what about me? I was preaching. I had, and, and, it, and it wasn't just one person. It was more than one. Now, I'm not giving you all the invitation to come talk to me like this. But I had people would come up to me and they say, oh, Pastor Bob, we love your teaching. But we sure do miss some of that. Some of that just get it and go. Or they'd give it a different name of some kind. You know, we call, we, you know, those of us in Pentecost, we called it hellfire and brimstone. We called it, you know, preach the wallpaper off a wall, you know, whatever you want to call it. Well, you know what it did? It began to imprint upon me that there was something that they wanted that I wasn't able to supply. And I, had, and I began to change who I was because the identity in me was in question. So guess what I started doing? Man, I was, uh, I even bought some suits. I went and bought some suits that looked like, Billy, like, like Benny Hinn. They didn't have collars. They were like just the Nehru collars. I mean, I look good. And I just started, ah, ah. And I just, I mean, I was, I was fighting it back and forth. Two weeks go by. I lost my voice. Gone. Gone. Went to the doctor. Couldn't get it back. Doctor said, what are you doing? 
I said, well, I'm just preaching. He said, well, you've got to stop it. I said, well, I'm not going to stop preaching. He said, no, whatever you're doing, you need to stop. I lost my voice. Had to have somebody preach for me for two weeks. Why? Because I'd lost my identity in what God had said about me. I was trying to impress someone else with an identity that was not me. You know what? We, we, we allow the devil, the devil to, he might say you're a failure. He might say you're a weakling. He might say you're a bad preacher. He might say you're a bad father. He might say you're a failed mother. He might say these things. He, it might even get you to the place of doubter or hurts, past hurts. And what we do is we wear them as a, as a necklace, like, the, like a wrapper with a big gold chain and says, this is me, I'm a sinner. Yeah, this is me, I'm a doubter. This is me, I'm a disappointment. This this is me. I'm a failure. But God said, that's not what I've called you. I've called you to be chosen. I've called you to be royalty. I've called you to be my very own possession. See, when we confuse our identity, when we confuse our identity, we lose the very power of God in our life. See, when I understand my identity, guess what? I can say I'm righteous. <laughs> Even though you look at me and say, that ain't a righteous brother right there. No, I'm righteous. I can tell you I'm an achiever. I can tell you I'm an overcomer. I'm strong. I'm faithful. I I'm more than a conqueror through Christ Jesus. I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. But those are the things that you can't, you can't say that. I have to find that out about me. If I don't find that out about me, I won't walk as a child of God. I won't walk as, a right, as the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. I won't walk sanctified, and I won't even walk saved. Guess what? Those are some big words, but they're power-filled words that we have to understand. We're not, I'm not identified by playing basketball. I'm not identified by being a preacher. I'm not identified by being a fireman. I'm not identified by being a former this or a former that or a present this or a present that. I'm identified by my walk in my relationship with Jesus Christ. See, one of the biggest tragedies I find in life is especially for the believer is to not know his or her identity in Christ. See, the Bible tells me in, Galatians, in Genesis chapter 1, God said, you know what, let's make man. Let's make man in our image. And I'm going to read out of the Living Bible just for fun, for just a minute. How many of you know I used it a couple weeks ago, that little puffy one, the little green puffy one? The little, you know which one I'm talking about? All right, everybody had the same one. The Bible says, then God said, let us make man, someone like ourselves, to be the master of all life upon the earth and in the skies and in the seas. Do you realize that God called you a master? God positioned you to be a master of all things. Why don't we see ourselves that way? Why don't we live our lives that way? Why don't we act that way? If I'm called to be a master, nothing else ought to have dominion over my life. If I'm the one that's supposed to have dominion. See, when mankind fell, it wasn't just into sin, but everything about him fell. But it was through Christ that there was a redemption that took place because of the fallen image and identity from the garden. Mankind has been trying to recreate their identity. And they do it and define it by what they think rather than what God thinks. Some of y'all are trying to keep up with what social media says about you. You're even, some of you are trying to keep up with even what you think you hear in your head. But God's def defined you designed you and created you see without an understanding of our identity our ability to walk in authority is limited our ability to walk in healing is limited our ability to walk as 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 children of God is limited because I don't if I don't see myself as a child of God my kids can come to me anytime they want to why don't I go to God anytime I want to I, they don't knock on the door they come right in. Dad, hey, can I have some? They, they even hit up my refrigerator without even asking. The reality is why is they know who they are. They know who they are. They're Bob's kids. They can have anything I have is theirs. It's available to them. See, when we reject what the Bible says about us as true, the theft of our identity takes place. When I don't believe what this word says about me, Guess what happens? The theft of our identity takes place. 
What am I saying? See, the Bible tells you in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, it says you're a new person. Romans says this, you are accepted. It says in the book of John 15, it says you are chosen. Galatians 4 says you are free. 1 John says this, you're forgiven. John 1 says you're a child of God. 1 Corinthians 3 says that you belong to Jesus. Philippians 3.20 says you are a citizen of heaven. 1 Peter 1.5 says you are protected by God. Romans 8.38 says God loves you no matter what. Somebody, I, I'm, for whatever reason, I keep going there. But God loves you no matter what. Zephaniah 3 says God is with you. Isaiah 43 says you're precious to God. The Bible says in Galatians 3.13, it says you are rescued. And it says in Jeremiah 29.11, he has a plan for you. See, I, I, I just stopped there. I didn't go, I mean, that's not exhausting the word of God. But the problem is most of us don't see those in ourselves. We struggle. See, when we don't think in line with the way God thinks about us, we find ourselves in the midst of an identity crisis. Our, our identity is in crisis. And any time, how many of you have ever been really successful in the midst of a crisis? We're stressed and depressed. We're worn out and tired. We're frustrated. And we don't function at the greatest level we possibly can because what we're trying to do is we're trying to identify ourselves by something rather than someone. If I don't identify by the someone, my very life is not functioning the way that it should. You were created. You were created just as the creator intended you because you have a purpose and he had a purpose for you. He wants to do something in you so that he can do something through you. But you know what? He can't do anything through you until you get an identity. And understand the identity that he has for you. See, our, identi our, our identity is in crisis. And we limit, God, we limit God's power in our lives. See, when, 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 I, when, I, when I don't grasp and I don't understand that when our identity is in crisis, we limit God's power in our lives. How, how does that happen? Spiritual confusion can set in. We can go through the process of insecurity. We can, we can have continuous bondage to sin. We can, have weak, we can have a weak witness. Do you realize that your own insecurities, your own identity crisis creates in you or, or in you through you a weak witness for Jesus Christ? When you don't know who you are, the world that's watching you has no interest in what you have. If you believe what you believe, believe it with all you got. When we don't understand these things, we, our, spiritual, our spirituality can become stagnant. We can have unfulfilled potential and even this terrible thing called a shallow faith. See, when my identity is not fulfilled in Christ and Christ alone, we search for other things. Go with me, if you will, to Luke chapter 15. We're going to close this up pretty quickly. Can I have... My music person, please, whoever that might be today. Thank you. As we get ready to close, I just want to share just a few thoughts from this story. I don't have time to go through it. But I'm going to just start reading real quickly in Luke chapter 15. Start reading in verse number 11. If you could throw that up for me. I'm just going to read just a little bit of this, okay? Just so you guys all know. It says, to illustrate the point further, Jesus told them this story. A man had two sons. The younger son told his father, I want, to share, I want my share of your estate now before you die. So his father agreed to divide his wealth between his sons. A few days later, the young, younger son packed his belongings and moved to the distant land. And there he wasted all of his money on wild living. About that time, his money ran out. A great famine swept over the land and he began to starve. He persuaded a local farmer to hire him and the man sent him. To his, into his fields to feed the pigs. The young man became so hungry that even the pods he was feeding the pigs looked good to him, but no one gave him anything. When he finally came to his senses, he said to himself, at home, even the hired servants have food enough to spare, and here I am dying of hunger. I'm going to stop right there. I'm going to share the rest of the story verbally. Most of you know this story. It's called the story of the prodigal son or the lost son. Some of you have children that are wayward, and I'll just believe with you that this becomes the foundation of truth for your life as you believe and call back those kids. 
But I want to I do a different spin on this sermon, on this normal salvation type message. Because I want to I talk to the church. This story is more than the younger son. It's a story really of two sons and a father. It's a big story. And it's a rich story. And it's a story riddled with individuals who don't understand who they are. You know, when, when, when we don't know who we are, the first thing you have to understand is we're going to look for it. We're going to search for it. There, there's going to be a, a process of time that, that you and I, and I, I think I have a slide for you, but it, it, it says when, when we don't know who we are, we'll search to find it. See, we're all looking. We're all looking for an identity. We're looking for it in a spouse. We're looking for it in a job. We're looking for it in our wealth. We're trying to create an identity for ourselves or identify ourselves by something. Here's a young man. Didn't understand who he was. The only thing he recognized, he said, my daddy's wealthy. I'm going to go get my stuff. He said, you know what? I can't find what I'm looking for here at home. I'm going to go look someplace else. So he went looking in other places. Guys, let me just ask you a question. What are you looking for? What are you searching for? What have you been missing? Like the younger son, we, we recognize and know the only things that we have, that the only things that are recognized as yours by faith can be transferred to you. He knew that his father's wealth was available to him. But we look for things. We search for things. We think we find things, but it's not always the case. Fast forward just a little bit, and you go down in the story, and it's amazing to me how oftentimes we allow, uh, when we don't know who we are, we allow our circumstances to mis be misinterpreted, misinterpreted or misunderstood of our self-worth. Do you, do you realize that, that, that this young man, he was, he was in the midst of the pig pen. And he began to identify himself as less than a servant. How do I know that? He said, you know what? Here I am stuck. Here I am stuck. He said, if I just go home, if I go home, I know I could be treated at least better, at least as good as the servants that were there. He said, they eat better than I do. He, he didn't have any aspiration to go home and be replaced and, and, and be called son again. He, he thought he'd squandered that. He thought he'd given up on that. He thought he didn't have a right to it. But guess what? Because of that thought process, many, can I just talk to the church for a minute? See, the problem is, is that many people come into the church and we find Jesus. But you know what? We don't live beyond the pig pen because we don't think we're worthy. We don't think what we're capable of it. We don't think that God wants us to. We don't think that, that, that we're worthy of it because what we do is we look at our circumstances. I'm divorced. I'm poor. Um, I've been a bad parent. Uh, I, I don't have anything. And, and what we do is we define ourselves we define ourselves and we create an identity by what we see rather than by who we are. See, the, 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 this young man, he moves beyond this place of misinterpreting his worth because at some point, let me just say this, at some point you are going to come face to face and have an encounter with who you really are. Every one of us do. And how we respond when that face-to-face -face encounter takes place, he came face-to-face -face with himself. I'm going to go home. Now, he didn't have an aspiration to be called son again. He just had an aspiration to be called slave. And so many of us in the church have an imagery of ourselves that we don't come in as sons and daughters of God. We come in as slaves and say, God, you've seen my life. If, if, if we used to sing songs of that. Can I just have a little, isn't it a little cabin in the corner of heaven? How damaging is that type of singing? Because what we're doing is, is we're not coming in believing we have a right to the mansions that God says we can have. Right? It's the image that we have of ourselves. It's the identity that we've created for ourselves. 
God is always trying to restore your identity. Do you realize this, guys? When he comes home, this young man comes home, the father, last week I, I, did, I did bionic man. and you, Did you know that the father came running when he saw him? See, that should have identified who he was, but he still didn't feel worthy. He came, he came running to his son, and he said, he said, I'm going to put the ring on his finger. I'm going to put the sandals on his feet. I'm going to put the coat on him. Hey, do me a favor. Guys, go kill the fatted calf. We're going to have a party. He said, Dad, Dad, no, no, wait a minute, wait a minute. I, I'm not even worthy to be called your son. And that's how many in the church are today. I, I'm not worthy to be called your son. He says, hey, you were once lost, but now you're found. He said, put this ring on, put this robe on, put these sandals on, let's have dinner. Well, that's where we normally end the story. But you know what? Because we have an identity crisis, this young man had an identity crisis. He went looking for an identity in places he ought not be looking for it. And guess what? There was an older son that had never left, but he still had an equally bad identity. Here's his identity. Well, bless God, I've been here the whole time. How come, how come I don't get treated this way? You know what? Some of y'all in the church have done that to your brothers and sisters in Christ. They come and they get saved. They, welcome, they walk into the church. They've been sinning their whole life. And all of a sudden, boom, they accept Jesus Christ as their Lord and personal Savior. And guess what happens? They come to the altar one time and boom, healing manifests. And somebody across the room is going, I've been in church my whole life. Never had a healing like that. God, why can't you do that for me? None of you have ever done that. Somebody got a new car and you didn't get one. Somebody, so, no, we start looking at this identity that this older son struggled with. You know what? With that, uh, with that older son, we, we develop this, this mindset of self-righteousness. We, we, we ask in arrogance, am I not good enough for you? He said that to the father. God, am I not good enough for you? His identity was wrapped up in being good. You might be here. You might be here, you serve in the church. You, you're an usher and a greeter. You're a parking lot attendant. You drive the bus every single week. You serve as a Sunday school teacher. And, and at some point in your mind, you don't, you've wrapped your identity in what you do rather than in who you are. You know, the father, he was regretfully the most misunderstood father there could have been. He looks at his son and he says, son, he said, you never left, but you know what? Everything I have is already yours. He said, it's yours. Well, why did you think you had to ask me to kill the fatted calf? Why did you have to ask me? Why, why did you have to think that way? Do you realize that even the older brother had an identity crisis? He didn't know who he was. He didn't understand who he was. So, so I'm going to just present something to the church because we got to get done here. Most of us either think like the young son or the older brother. And because of that, we wonder why the church isn't more powerful today. Because we don't understand who we are and what God has done for us. You know, as I was thinking about my closing thoughts, we mistake what we do for who we are. But you know what? This is the truth. We never can see what God sees except by what the word. So I have to accept what he says about me. I'm chosen. I'm royalty. The Bible tells me in this particular passage of scripture, it says that it says you are a chosen people. You are a royal priest, a holy nation, God's very own possession. And as a result, you can show others the goodness of God, for he called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Once you had no identity as a people, now you are God's people. Stop identifying. Stop identifying yourself by what others have said about you, by the mistakes that you've made. See, this is tough stuff. 
if the church would get this, we would become, we would become the rock stars of the world. When you get the identity, when you get your identity and you understand who you are, people might even say words like this. Man, he's arrogant. Man, he seems prideful. No, I know I'm a child of the king. You can't talk to me that way. You can't say those things about me. I refuse to accept those things. Because guess what? Greater is he that is in me than he that's in this world. Guess what? No weapon formed against me has a right to prosper. Guess what? I'm more than a conqueror through Christ Jesus. Guess what? I always triumph. Guess what? He supplies every one of my needs according to his riches and glory. I know who I am. Do you know who you are? Do you know who you are? Because I think probably the most significant damage to the church is a church that does not know who they are. It's the greatest way that the devil can hurt the Father is because it hurts you not knowing what he did for you. With every head bowed and every eye closed, nobody looking around, we got to get done. As I wrap up this series on tough stuff, if we don't understand who we are in Christ, we will miss the benefits of obedience, forgiveness, loving people. We'll not become successful in crucifying our flesh and having a successful thought life. We won't even be able to control our words properly. Our identity has to be found in Jesus Christ. See, your, your, your identity is either wrapped in Jesus or it's not. When we lack an understanding of who we should be, the enemy steals what we learn and it never gets root. You might be here this morning and you're having an identity crisis. I don't know what part of your identity is in crisis, but you're having an identity crisis. Maybe you don't know who you are. Or maybe you've attached your identity to some past failure or fault. You're struggling and walking who God says you are. I want you to do me a favor. Raise your hand real quick. Everybody's got their eyes closed, but raise your hand. If you're in this place and you're struggling with an identity issue, raise your hand. Anybody in the room? Anybody? There's hands. There's hands. One, two. Keep your hand up. I want to see them. I'm trying to count them. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Anybody else? Nine. Anybody else struggling in their identity? All right, put your hands down. Ten, I see that hand. I'm sorry about that. Hallelujah. Father, I just pray as we close this sermon out, I would raise my hand that there are times, Father, that I've allowed my identity to be in crisis. I've defined myself by something that you don't define me as. Father, I pray right now, Lord, that first and foremost, for those nine people that raised their hands, there might have been more that maybe, they, maybe, maybe their identity wouldn't even allow them to raise their hand. I don't know. But God, corporately, we ask for forgiveness. Because, Father, when we choose an identity that is not your identity for us, we're in sin. And so, Father, I ask that you would forgive me of having a wrong identity or seeing myself not as you see me. Father, I pray right now, Lord, that you'd redefine my mind and allow me, Heavenly Father, to grasp what Jesus did in, its, in his entirety through Calvary, his death, burial, and resurrection. Father, I thank you that right now in this church, Heavenly Father, we become a church that is identified, Heavenly Father, as those individuals that have been crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, we live. Yet not I, but Christ who liveth within me. God, that is the faith and the hope and the glory that needs to be revealed in each one of us. Help me to understand, Father, I'm chosen. Help me understand, Father, that I'm royalty. Help me understand, Heavenly Father, that I, I am a possession of the Most High God. Father, help me. Help this church and help these people to walk in an identity that identifies Christ and nothing else. Father, we thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen.